series that we've been doing, and actually our first event was held right here at Antioch when after the Paris talks and COP21, we held a public forum to inform the public about what this um, COP21 meant because it was more, um, what came out of that was to not have national leaders take the lead, but to have citizens participate. So in this very room, we held that, and we had to overflow going out to the door, people coming in to learn what that was about. And so uh, we've gone on with many other, um, we've actually been doing programs for almost 20 years now, all uh, around um, sustainability, permaculture, ecological design. And many people, this room is pretty well informed, of course, but many people think permaculture is just about gardening or farming, but permaculture, of course, is about designing in balance with nature, whether it's your home, your city, your buildings, or your land. And um, the word permaculture came in the beginning to when Bill Mollison and his student, then student David Holmgren, uh, realized or there was stated that you could not have an ongoing civilization without sustainable agriculture, some form of sustainable agriculture. Every civilization failed unless you got that one down. And so that was the focus in the earlier days. So um, we thought tonight, since there's a big focus on climate, uh, there seems to be an uptick in interest all over our community right now. And we just wanted to uh, set the tone with a short video with a young Swedish student, 15 years old, when she began putting her uh, plea out to the world. And she recently went to the UN and Davos for the business leaders around the world. And I won't say any more, but just to see where we are now with things and a heartfelt thing from a young Swedish girl. Uh, it's very beautiful, actually. Many events. We are going to end today um, with the words of 15 year old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg, who addressed the UN plenary session last night. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of Climate Justice Now. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you're never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. 
we cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. addressing the UN plenary last night. She has called for a global school strike on Friday. That does it for our show. Okay, thank you. Um, um, she kind of is a call to action, and Margie and I feel the same way. Uh, this year will be we are non-stop. We are going to produce so much positive energy for our community for solutions. We are launched on a big program. It is massive, the amount of stuff you will see coming in this next year. Hooray! Yes! Because we need to step up with solutions. And as Margie and I, with that slide, we're all elders in the making. And us older elders need to walk with the younger as far as we can. It's really important. They need to know we're here. So that for us is our call to action. And we reach out to everybody. If you need, we'd love support. You can go to our website, make a donation. You will see stuff coming to the community that we have been incubating for a number of years and it will just keep rolling. Um, we are very proud to do this. We. What it is with elders, you get a collective feel of what to do next that you can't explain when you're young. It's just, I call it like I was talking to a, a long-term activist, and I said, it's the arc of an activist. You just like your arc coming, and you just don't know that arc reaches this incredible place. So tonight, we really feel honored to, because we feel that and we've put out that um, we need to deal with the legacy pollution that we have. We're talking about a green economy, but we're not talking about the toxic world that we live in that's slowly killing us. We can have all these great ideas, which are good, but we need to start using the biological power of nature to start healing this environment. And that's why when we went to Soil Not Oil, um, there was a panel up there, and the two people that Margie and I had been talking about were there. That was like, we didn't know to the last moment, and there they were on the same panel. Tom Duncan and Lila Darvish speaking. And so I just walked up to them and I said, you and you are coming to Santa Barbara. And they're like, what? I said, no, it's just simple, you'll be here, because your message is what we need to do when we're talking about how do we give tools for younger people? How do we give communities knowledge to deal with this toxic material that we have? And it's in every part of our being, and our bodies, but in, is it, it's in our ecosystem, it's also in nature's ecosystem. So we need to understand that we need to know to get those tools and not feel like we have to reach out to government or we have to business to solve our solutions. No, we need to grab these right now and really show that we are a part of this ecosystem and the healing of it. So, am I supposed to do something next? Well, we do want to speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, briefly talk about the workshops tomorrow and um, yeah. how the evening will unfold. And um, let's briefly talk about um, Lila and Tom will both be doing workshops tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Lila starts at 9.30 and Tom starts at 1.30. Yes, and they will talk more about it when they're up here. Our upcoming events, if you saw there, uh, John D. Lu. Uh, we are going to honor him for as an eco hero because he's approaching 
this problem on a global scale of healing. We have so much land, 10,000 years of agriculture have left us with a planet that's just a desert in so many areas. That's just created refugees. We think of refugees now, refugees were always on the move. When, when, our, when our ecosystem and our biological wealth of our soil collapses, people get on the move. It's just a, it's just a response. So we have been refugees, many of us come from families who were refugees fleeing. We just don't know many times that that's it. And so John will be honoring him on March 17th with our first Eco Hero Award and um, at the Libero at 6.30. And there'll be reception after. So tickets are on sale. It is amazing his work and his vision of organizing our community to do communities all over the world where there is that desertification to form eco camps, eco restoration camps, so that young people from around the world and people in the community can join together to get the necessary tools to heal the land. So it's like, it's just like a mass school of ecosystems learning. And permaculture comes from that, so you'll see a lot of the permaculture community has been gelling this information for over 40 years and is now ready to step up and work with John on massive scales. There is 300 million hectares of land that is desert, or is in the process of becoming desert, and it has been abandoned. And there's people hanging on there only for what brief existence, you know. And so we need to empower people to stay on their stay in their community and see a new hope, and not have the young people keep fleeing to elsewhere. Um, we'd also like to, th and we also have. Marine permaculture, which is really amazing. If you've looked, read, if you've looked at it, Drawdown, it's one of his new, I think it's like the up and coming solution for re harvesting, re, uh, for putting kelp back into the uh, marine area. And that's Brian von Herzitz, Herzen, and he'll be here in May. And I'm lousy with words. And so I'd like to to um, thank our sponsors, the Community Bio Council, Blue Sky Biochar, hey. the Independent, hey, Michael. Yeah, Michael, always such a good supporter, hey. Antioch University for when we reached out for providing us with the space, which is really nice, they've made available for us. And so I'd like to, would you want to start with an introduction for, for uh, um, Paul Margie, our moderator? Right. So um, Paul is um, one of our original eco heroes. Paul is uh, at um, age 22 when we had, this year we're celebrating, celebrating the 1969 massive oil spill in our Santa Barbara channel. And Paul Rellis was one of the young people who um, was so, you can't even call it disturbed. We saw our whole channel fill with oil and nobody really knew what to do, including uh, many young 20-year-olds, many students. Another one sitting in the audience will be on our panel, Mark McGinnis. And these uh, young people just took action right away. And the other really beautiful part is they partnered with their elders, the very thing that we're talking about. There were even, there were businessmen, there were all kinds of people that stepped forward and helped the youth of that time begin to do it. So Paul Rellis this evening will be our moderator for the panel. That will take place after um, the, Lila and Tom give their talks. And we have uh, different people that Paul will uh, introduce. And they will uh, just be answering one question that's supposed to evoke a response that is from their particular background, where, what, where they're coming from. That We've done this many times before, and it's to hear if you're coming from a social justice background, if you're coming from academia, the students, if you're coming from business. So in this case, this legacy of toxic in our air, water, and soil if you're working, if you're social justice and you're working with vulnerable communities, what is, how, how, after hearing Tom and Lila, how can you see, um, both of them talk about, um, Lila especially will say, we need to scale up, we need to educate, we need to, you know, get active. There really aren't going to be people, uh, you can't count on government, you can't count on the corporations, and you have to stop 
putting that in their hands to take care of. That actually happened with the 1969 oil spill. People stepped up and realized that we needed to face. And luckily we were in a community that had a lot of citizen activism. So, um, Paul went on to uh, work with government. Uh, that's something Wes and I look at all the time and think that we can want all the best environmental solutions, but if you're not paying attention to policy, that next step, and after 20 years of being the uh, director of the Community Environmental Council, was it 20 years? Yeah. Um, went to work with state government, and he'll explain more, but now is working for CR&R Enviro Environmental Services. And it's very exciting. We've been down to see some of their projects, and it's a, a beautiful uh, example of business partnering. And they did from those earlier days. Um, CRNR partnered with you, is that correct? Or came yes. and helped and worked? That's right. And um, thought that these students had some answers for business. And, and then they came in with their support. So at the moment, what they're working on is uh, an anaerobic digester, right? Correct. <laughs> and you'll explain more, because. Uh, uh, but what they're doing is taking from these very large counties, Riverside and San Bernardino, both the uh, the green waste, the the food scraps, and with this uh, very. Um, it's from Germany, but the technology very advanced, and uh, turning it into something akin to natural gas, and will replace uh, the fuel used in the large trucks that go and collect that. So. Most counties, I think maybe Santa Barbara, are we still using diesel? Are we Del uh, To a large extent. Yeah. And it has that particularly dirty, large particulate matter. And, and I heard a statistic once that in Riverside County, it's responsible for 70% of all the cancer, mm -hmm. maybe lung cancer. But if, to clean that up is a huge deal. And so that's the project CRNR, and that Paul, as a senior vice president, he's done all the research and um, fostered that along. So Paul will be our moderator, and everyone welcome Paul. Yeah. And he will talk a little more about CRNR. Thank yeah, you. because it's pretty exciting. Thanks, Wes and Margie. If they ever ask me to do something, I'll do it. They, they are truly an amazing community resource. I've, I've never seen the kind of consistent quality programming that, that they put forth, and they're heroes in their own way. Let's see, where did my papers go? Okay. Yeah. Let's look. So, um, thanks for coming out tonight, and uh, I'm particularly interested in the subject matter this evening because I've spent my whole career in waste. Uh, started with the waste <laughs> oil lapping ashore, and then the Community Environmental Council was very early on in recycling and composting and gardens and recycling of every form we could think of and it's been a lifelong turned into a lifelong passion of mine and i felt fortunate that i could work at cec for 20 years and then turn it over to then john clark and the others uh, that have carried on the work so well and then i went into government to sort of to experience the beast uh, and I, uh, I needed to do that for my own development. I wanted to understand whether I could have any impact on colleagues in the field. So I have sort of lucked into a position to oversee the waste system of California for seven years. Um, but uh, there were, in, after 40 board meetings and such, I felt like more a talking head, and I missed the experience. I always liked to build things. CEC was always about applied work, you know. You want to grow your food, well, build a garden. You want to recycle, well, build a recycling center. You want to manage household toxic waste, you have a collection and processing program. Uh, 
So uh, you want to recycle organic materials, we'll learn to compost. Um, and we did all those things as very young people, and it turns out uh, we had a methane digester at our little farm downtown uh, by a South African pig farmer who retired here. L little did I think I would be involved in building maybe the largest digester in certainly North America. So um, you don't know where these things are going to go when you start. You just have to start. And that's what I always try to tell young people. I, Mark, due to Mark, I was able to teach at UCSB for about 16 years. And, um, you know, I'd always say, well, you, the young people are asking, what shall I do? How will I find a career? How, well, somewhere you have to engage. If it's law, if it's economics, if it's uh, technology, if it's community organizing, uh, you begin where you begin, and then you see where it leads you. Um, I'll say just a few words about what I do today, because it, it's all been variations on the same theme. Uh, now, instead of a small compost pile or a, an inner tube digester, this is a, we have built in Riverside County um, a two, two huge artificial stomachs is what I call them and we take the household organic waste like your green can and now we allow you to put your food waste in the green can we pick it up and we process it very carefully to remove every contaminant we can remove plastic because even in the green cans people toss uh, so it's never uh, a precise thing. It never probably will be. But we um, imported German technology. We imported New Zealand technology to convert the raw biogas to clean it up to what we call fuel grade uh, so we can replace fossil fuel natural gas with carbon neutral and we believe will eventually be classified as carbon negative fuel uh, but as determined by the California Air Resources Board. So we serve 15 municipalities. The company serves almost 3 million people. So yesterday we had um, Denmark, uh, the government of Denmark and researchers from the universities and a couple of business people we spent all day comparing notes on what Denmark's trying to do to be a climate change, to, to meet their climate change and objectives. And it was very heartening to hear that they decided that biogas played this critical, pivotal role between solar and wind. Because solar and wind, as uh, strong as they are, uh, are, not, are intermittent and we need backup power. So your choice is, even in an all-electric uh, effort, as we have in California, it may be very important, and Denmark has decided that they're not going to rely purely on bat battery storage capacity. There's some very big challenges with that. That biogas can play the intermediate role at a fraction of the cost. And so, um, it gave me a certain sense of here's this small country and then we laugh because uh, we're serving uh, about half the number of people in Denmark in one company so it just it's a mess but the vision the strength of their uh, at analysis was just beautiful to hear and, and the country's going gangbusters in the biogas development I'll stop there with uh, just because it's relevant, it's part of the waste problem, all this organic waste that goes to landfills and outgasses as methane and as powerful climate change gas. So let's shift now to our speakers. And um, I want to uh, quickly um, introduce them. And I've read part of Lila Darwish's 
book, which uh, is out there for you to buy afterward, called Earth Repair, A Grassroots Guide to Healing Toxic and Damaged Landscapes. Well, we know we've got plenty of those, and we've experienced toxic and damaged landscapes on our beaches here in Santa Barbara, on land with spills, and uh, just we're, we're just a small little piece. Go down to Los Angeles and the rail yards and the old industrial sites. Go to the East Coast, to the Rust Belt. Um, go anywhere today, and the legacy of a lack of care, insight, and prior no policies to affect this. This is earth repair that is required. And then, so she has played a role, a very big role in community organizing around this issue. And now I understand you're with the city of New, or New Orleans, or New Orleans? New Orleans? No. Okay, no. So I don't know. It's, I don't know that I'll ever get it, but maybe I'll know. Um, but I'm very interested to hear more about your work tonight. I think you all will be. Uh, and then Tom Duncan, who has worked on uh, global scale in China and other parts of Asia, uh, beginning his work in Australia. Um, the down under country that ha faces very uh, massive climate change problems. But I can think of no more important work than earth repair. We, I think, as the young woman said from Sweden, we correctly, uh, we think we're on some linear journey to, uh, the, to a green future. Um, and okay, I'm in technology and I deal with something that I think has worldwide promise, but the legacy of the damage is massive. Few of us understand it, and few have tapped the basic, I guess, the biology, the, the healing power of nature if left uh, to itself or helped by um, humans to accelerate a process that might otherwise take uh, much longer. So I first came across the toxic issue um, early in the work of the Community Environmental Council. Some of you are old enough to know our old Gilday Center. And we, um, we had a relationship with Brown University um, where professor of chemistry there had come and I'll never forget this. Do you remember the time when we were transporting truckload after truckload through Santa Barbara of toxic waste to the um, Casmalia waste facility in North County? And the theory then was, well, if it's polluted, you take tractors and dig it up and put it in trucks and run it, you know, 100 or 200 miles, and then you dump it into another place that's supposedly safe, you know, these big pits. That, so that was uh, my introduction, and I remember him saying to me, this professor from Brown, he said, you know, sometimes it's better just to leave the problem where it is and remediate it where it is. And that always stuck with me, like, hmm. I mean, as you're watching hundreds of trucks go through town and then you find out that the, the remediation site leaks, uh, well, the, the answers become more apparent. So um, with that, I think I will call on Lila to come up and give her presentation followed by Tom, and then we will have our, our panel will come up and we'll have a good discussion. So please welcome Lila.
Great. You can all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it's great to be in Santa Barbara, and I'm really happy that Wes and Marty invited me. Um, I didn't know that you guys had had a huge oil spill in 1969 because I'm from Canada. That's my excuse. Because <laughs> we have so many oil spills of our own, I just didn't notice. Um, but uh, learning about it and kind of hearing some of the roles that different people played and just the intensity of that spill, um, it's one of the reasons why I do this work. Because I'm from Alberta, and if people know Alberta, they know we have the tar sands and nickelback. That's what we export <laughs> to the world, and they're terrible. Um, and we just have a lot of oil spills. And I spent, my background is in environmental science, and I spent about 15 years as a community organizer on different environmental justice struggles, mainly fighting tar sands, pipelines, fracking, and nuclear. Um, and in all those situations when I was doing that work, a lot of it was working with communities that people were getting sick, they were getting cancer, their water was poisoned, the animals that they hunt and fish were being full of tumors and things like that because of the toxic contamination, either from projects that were ongoing or that had been long gone and left behind a lot. So I was always in these situations where we were alerting the government, we were kind of organizing citizens to kind of get out there and kind of fight in solidarity with these communities, but there comes a point when the healing has to happen and there was, that piece was missing. Because you could kind of thunder and say, we need this fixed, we need this taken away, you need to kind of deal with this oil, and if you don't have the right kind of government or a corporation that is gonna do it the right way, it doesn't always happen. Or if you're a community that doesn't have the political power because of racism and, and other pieces, then it doesn't happen at all. So I kind of was in this activism place of being like, how do we make that happen? How do we as people take those skills and find ways to actually invest in our communities with the tools to do some of this cleanup. Not because we should be doing it necessarily, but because we're gonna have to do it. Because I think there's a lot of communities that believe like this happened to them, they shouldn't have to be doing this work. And that's true because somebody else made the mess, but at the end of the day, if they won't clean it up, and you care about the land and you care about the water, and it is always the people who live in the place who care, they gotta figure out how to do it. So that was just kind of what got me into this. Um, at the same time, I've been learning about permaculture, and in my permaculture classes, we always talked about bioremediation. It was like three hours, or one hour, where we talk about you know, how you can use mushrooms to clean up oil spills, but again, I wasn't seeing that actually happen in terms of in communities or people responding to spills in that way. Um, and so it made me want to kind of dive in and try to learn and bring that information out. And so that's kind of what led to getting into this and also um, starting to do this work. I'm assuming this is what I'm using to move. Yeah. I'll point to the to the thing. Oh. No. Sure. Where's God? <laughs> okay. It doesn't want to cooperate. Unless wait a second. Okay, we have to do a right here. So you don't have any of the slides. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> just the space. Just the space. Yeah. yeah. That's easy. It's like a monkey button. Yes. So <laughs> in terms of boom, it's gonna help you out too. Um, just in depth. So we're gonna talk about bioremediation today. Um, how many people have heard about bioremediation before? Seem like a pretty in the know kind of people. So I'm gonna fly through it since you know. Do people know it really well? Okay, I'll go slow. Um, also, I tend to talk quickly. If I'm going too fast, just put your hand up, and then I'll be like, right, I need to slow down. And I'm Canadian, but I live in New Orleans, so I start saying words like A and y'all at the same time, which is just awful. So if you notice that, I'm sorry. Um, so definition for bioremediation, I like to say it's align yourself with living systems to detoxify and generate contaminated environment. And it's done in different ways. We're either trying to bind the contaminants, extract, or transform them, right? And it's important to know what you're doing with what. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but if we're talking about heavy metals, we're trying to bind it or we're trying to extract it. We can't really break it down into something. If we're talking about things like oil, then we're looking at transforming it more, right? Um, and in bioremediation, we talk about microbial remediation, which is working with bacteria, phytoremediation, which is working with plants, and microremediation, which is working with fungi. It's pretty simple. And one thing people tend to do in industry, they use the word bioremediation when they're just talking about bacteria. So I always feel like I gotta break it down a little bit more to kind of use a few different words. So there's different reasons why I believe it's so important and kind of why I do it. 
food security and food justice is huge because again we live in cities and urban areas where the land because of how we've lived how we've built um, what's been there before us is largely contaminated right like there's lead that's going to be in the soil because houses had lead-based paint right you're going to find things like cadmium and arsenic and as people get really excited about kind of local food urban food permaculture in the cities and they find these lots and they want to kind of start doing incredible projects they have to decide how are they going to do that? How are they going to grow healthy food and medicine? And there is this piece where you'll often see people just do the grow up and the boxes. And that's something you bring all your soil in and you kind of build a box on top of contaminated land. But the real healing would be can you heal that land and not just be trucking in soil, right? And so for me, we have a finite amount of land. And often in cities, they're not going to give you the best stuff anyway. And so you can find a way to clean it up is a good thing. So that's a huge piece is the security and the justice. The other piece is that we are faced often with ecological disasters, as you well know, from Santa Barbara. Um, you know, some of the pictures up there, we all know the Exxon Valdez. That was a pretty galvanizing moment uh, for me growing up. The BP Gulf spill, which is, you know, they're still seeing the impacts to this day. Pipelines blowing out, oil trains blowing out. Like, we live in a world because of the fossil fuel infrastructure no place is safe. You could be in the most pristine area. So I'm from like Canada and I was living in northwestern BC where it's all salmon and happy times and you can have a tank and just have its moment and then there goes your fishing, right? And so because of the movement of fuels, everyone's kind of open for that. And same thing when we're talking about mining disasters, fracking disasters, um, Fukushima. These are things that make people try to figure out how can we fix it because the industry can only go so far. And they've been allowed to operate saying, yes, we can fix it, but as they found out with the BP spill, they could not. <coughs> and actually what they did made it worse in some ways. And their oil spill response plan had been cut and pasted from their Arctic plan. I don't know if people know that. They went to actually look at the BP plan and there was mentions of walruses. And anyone who's been to the Gulf of Mexico knows there's no walruses there. So you have these people operating who are not necessarily the best at their job. And even if they are, their technology can only get so much given the nature of what's happening. So there are people who are trying to do their job right, I'll, I'll be nice and say that, um, but they say in certain situations with the oil, you can only get 20% of it in a situation like the Gulf of Mexico or in an open ocean situation, and so the rest of that is gonna end up in our environment. The company's done, they say we've done the best we can, and then the rest of us have to continue living with that, and so does that environment. So again, we think about remediation saying, how do we, how do we deal with that? And those are huge problems, and from a bioremediation standpoint, we're not necessarily there yet in terms of scale, but we're having to ask those questions because otherwise people are just going to inherit bigger and bigger crises. Um, and then the other exciting thing is natural disasters, which is something I work a lot in now. I got my Master's of Disaster down in New Orleans, it's an actual <laughs> master's program, uh, to do disaster resilience and response, and I got it just for that name. That's the only reason why. <laughs> um, but, you know, who knows what the picture on the left is? Anybody? Houston. Houston, yeah, could have been New Orleans too, but this is when Harvey, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas. There's all these petrochemical kind of facilities down there, and there was huge amounts of spills. And again, those waters went around, and there's a lot of neighbors around those kind of facilities that are poor Latino and African American communities. And when those flood waters receded, that was kind of left there, right? And those folks are trying to rebuild their homes and recover, and no one, in terms of the actual government, is paying attention to that. Right? And so we see these natural disasters that become environmental crises. The picture on the right, you all know what that's from? Paradise. Um, not Paradise, actually, oh, I think. I think that's the Tubbs fire. I think it's Sonoma County. But it could be Paradise. Yeah, it's it's that, same, that same level of uh, destruction. And you guys know this too well in California with the, the fires. And again, forest fires, I mean, they have their impacts, but when they go through towns and cities that have been built with toxic materials and they burn those down, you end up with these toxic situations after with the ash and what's going to happen with the ash. And I think people have seen that in a bunch of different situations. And there is a role that bioremediation can play. And we've seen one or two communities actually step up and try to do that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later and also tomorrow more. Um, before we get into it, I just want to do a quick, I'm going to have two reality checks because the thing with the mediation, it kind of burnt me out a little bit with it, is people get really excited. And they say, oh my God, mushrooms can heal the world. I see an oil spill, I want to throw mycelium on it. And, and that's not going to work all the time. And so it's just that thing of being like, if you're going to do this work, you got to do it right. you got to be tight. Um, you got to do your research. Um, but there's a few things to kind of keep in mind. 
It is cheaper than conventional remediation in some ways, because in conventional remediation, they're really relying on big technology and kind of big movement. So you were talking about the whole waste kind of being moved. If this whole room was toxic soil in conventional remediation, what you would do is dig it all up and then send it somewhere else and dump it and then truck in new soil, right? And that, again, that costs a lot of money, and that's one of the cheaper kind of modalities of doing it, and it just gets more techy and kind of goes up from there. That's not something that's always available to communities to do. And even if it was, where is that toxic soil going? Likely to another community that's poorer than you and not white, right? That's usually how it rolls. It's environmental racism, and it keeps playing out the same way. And so we want to kind of avoid that, and that's why doing in situ remediation, where you're trying to clean it up in place instead of ex situ, where you're moving it, is ideal. Um, but even though it might be cheaper, doing bioremediation is very time and labor intensive because you are working with living beings and you have to take care of them, right? And it also involves a lot of people, which means personality conflicts. Um, but really, it's, I say it's time and labor intensive because, again, people think it's easy. They think there's an oil spill, they can grab some mushrooms, throw it on the oil, and then walk away. And that is never how that works. Um, and I've seen people burn communities that way by kind of coming in and promising too much and being like, oh yeah, I can totally fix your mining disaster by hemp bombing it with a seed ball. And uh, people lose faith. And so we have to be really real about it. The other reality check is chemicals versus metals. Again, just I love the heavy metal sign being like, yes. Um, heavy metals last, they don't go anywhere, right? Long live heavy metal. Um, because lead is lead is lead and zinc is zinc. They're gonna stay the way they are. So you sometimes see people saying, we're gonna break down the heavy metals. You know, there's a bunch of bioremediation that happened in a few different communities about five years ago where they used sunflowers to kind of pull up a bunch of heavy metals and then they were so excited about it. They're like, oh, look at us, we clean the land. We're gonna take those sunflowers, compost them, and then put it back on the land and grow our food because they thought they were wizards and alchemists. Um, but they were not, and again, they just concentrated the metals and then spread them. And so it's real important for people to get the difference between chemicals and metals and how we when working in hydrocarbons, we can break them down in different ways. When we're working with lead and arsenic, we're trying to immobilize it, we're trying to extract it, and it can take a long time. And often our sites don't just have one. They have several different things, so you have to handle it different ways. And the thing with bioremediation is you kind of cultivate a big toolbox and you figure out what's gonna work. And if you're stubborn, like the whole no one size fits all, it's really particular to your site and to your contaminant what you're actually gonna be working with. So if you have a site that is sun-baked, are you gonna throw mushrooms on it? I mean, you could, but it's gonna be fighting an uphill battle, right? You might wanna try plants, you might wanna to try to modify that environment to actually work to somehow facilitate mushrooms. If you have a metal, you're gonna do something different than if you have a chemical. So it's just a matter of trying to figure out what you have. And I, I enjoy the challenge of it, and I find it like, really exciting, but some people again get very stubborn and they're like, I have lead and I read Paul Stamets' mushroom book and I want to put my ceiling on the lead. And you're like, dude, no. And so that <laughs> happens a lot. Um, and I get calls about that all the time. Um, the other thing is a reality check. The easiest, I think, in terms of when you're doing bio mediation is land and then surface water and then groundwater. It's really, really, really difficult. Same thing with ocean. Like You start moving into bigger, bigger environments, especially where the contamination is harder to reach and you kind of take yourself out of that grassroots fire mediation. Where we are right now, we don't have the resources to do something like really contaminated groundwater, right? Doesn't mean people shouldn't try, um, but it's what we're doing. And then the final thing I have is woo your allies. You have to court the creature. Um, I originally had to court the creature and then I changed it. But plants and mushrooms and bacteria are living beings. And again, you can't, why industry struggles with doing this work is that they want something they can take down from the shelf whenever they want and put it on some, right? They wanna be able to store it in mass and then throw it on it. And that doesn't necessarily work with mushrooms. It's kinda of why micro-remediation, you don't see industry doing it. They've done phyto and they've done uh, bacterial, but they've been kinda of stuck on the micro because you need to know how to grow mushrooms, you need to know how to give them what they want, and to actually be like a bit of a whisperer. Because they don't wanna grow on your toxic, shitty side any more than anything else does. And so you have to kinda of woo them in and give them treats. Everything's like that, people are like that too. So it's just things to think about. Um, quickly, just gonna briefly say with microbial remediation, we're gonna talk about this tomorrow in the workshop. I'm gonna go into how you do it and deeper, but I wanna give time for everyone to kind of do the panel piece. But these are just some examples of microbial remediation. Often when we're working with microbes, 
we are trying to either bring kind of beneficial uh, bacteria onto a site that's contaminated and damaged to kind of restart um, kind of the soil uh, ecology um, and bring in microbes that can actually do some of the work of breaking down um, things like hydrocarbons. Or what we're trying to do is actually use things like composting to break down hydrocarbons and break down different things. Um, you can also use microbes to kind of immobilize, but just some different pieces there, like the activated, um, the activated aerated compost tea that you see at the top. A lot of people do compost teas, and I can't tell you how many workshops I've done where people are like, oh, I do that, but they've been making the wrong thing for their, like, their whole permaculture career, right? Because there's a certain way you've got to make compost tea to actually make it a remediation situation. Biochar is nodding. Right? No. Um, and so you have to kind of train people right. It's not just how you make it, it's the kind of bacteria you put into it. And it's not hard. Like I read about it in the book, it's all over the internet, but you've got to do it right. And what you can do is if you do this, you can then take that to use to inoculate your site with beneficial bacteria. You can take that and put it on contaminated earth and kind of use it to help kind of compost and kind of break that down as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with the compost tea, but you've got to make it right. And there are people who do um, kind of trademarked kind of bacterial inoculants that you can add and kind of do your own tea that way and it's kind of, they patented it and everything. But really they've used the labs to be like, these are the bacteria that you can use to break down this, this, and this. Um, when I was writing my book, I met a guy like that and I was kind of being like, tell me what you put in your stuff. And he wouldn't tell me and then I got him drunk and he told me two things. <laughs> and uh, one of them, which is great, one of them was that he uses worm castings. Worm poop. Does anybody know why? No, but also good. Also good, but no. What? No. Mm -mm. Oh, that's a different sound right there. Um, it is actually, those are all right. I mean, the phosphorus is great. But the reason why is that the, in the gut of the worm, there is a bacteria called Pseudomonas florensis. And this bacteria is actually, it likes to eat oil. It's petrophilic. So again, you can kind of get all techie about it or just find that out and get some worm poop. Right? And make sure that makes it into your inoculant. Um, so there's just different pieces like that. Um, so that's something that, again, like we talk more about in the remediation. One of the things that uh, the guy I was talking about, he does a lot of composting of oil contaminated soil. And so he'll do things like windrows, where he'll take oil contaminated soil and build these hot composts. And, and then, kind of, not with by hand, but with kind of front end loaders, because you don't want to be getting too close to this stuff, because as it heats up, it starts to let off kind of volatile organic compounds and things you don't want to breathe in, he'll kind of be turning that compost, getting it cooking, and then spraying it with the kind of petrophilic um, compost tea to kind of break it down further. And he's had really good results of getting things down to like 80-90%, right? So that's something. Um, there's quite a few examples of oil spills where they've used more bacterial remediation. And they've done it either by kind of doing the inoculant piece or they actually just spray things like phosphorus and nitrogen on a beach to kind of get the bacteria cooking, but there's problems with that, right? Um, but there's been some neat stories on that. Um, another thing that the microbes just do, like if you're really good at making incredible compost, I like to call it micro-orgasmic compost, right? <laughs> just taking that extra mile. And again, not all compost is created equally. If you're good at making that kind of compost, you can use it to build up your soil. If you have toxic soil underneath, which let's say we have lead in the soil, and we want to actually kind of immobilize the lead, and you don't want people touching it. Because the big thing about lead is it getting on your stuff. It's not so much that it moves into it. It's kind of a big, clunky um, metal that way. It's more that the dust gets onto the, the vegetables. It gets onto people's hands. It gets into children in terms of them kind of putting their hands in the soil and getting it in their mouth. And so if you can find a way to kind of cover that up, that's part of the battle. Making really incredible compost and getting that on top, you're building your soil up, but you're also inoculating below with these beneficial bacteria. So there's just different ways to work it. And then in the middle is biochar. The biochar has a whole special thing that it can do. Do you want to say something? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to talk more about biochar tomorrow. But I mean, it is a really incredible thing in terms of if you are working with beneficial bacteria, it creates almost, I mean, just the surface area in biochar. You can actually kind of charge it with the compost tea. And then it's like a like a super condo. I hate saying the word condo because I associate condos. It's a luxury condo for bacteria because there's so much surface there. And they're like, I can live here, I can live here. And again, when you're wooing your creature, you're trying to give it food and habitat, right? And the more of that you can give, the better. Biochar is also really good at immobilizing certain metals and kind of, again, they adhere to it. There you go. So I'm going to bring you everywhere. But uh, so those are some of the ways we talk about microbial remediation. And there's 
industry does it. I've seen some pretty interesting stuff with the oil spills around that. Um, and also I see a lot of people in any kind of trying to build a soil back for urban gardening. It's a great way to do it. And it doesn't get enough love because bacteria aren't sexy to most people like mushrooms are, but they are incredibly sexy because they do their job quietly and I appreciate that. Um, phytoremediation, talking about plants. Also, I want someone to tell me when I hit 40 minutes. Okay, because I'm just going to keep going and get excited. Um, everybody knows about plants because again, we've been hearing about it for a while. In the top left is actually a picture post-Katrina where they actually did some bioremediation post-Katrina. It didn't get the best reputation because people didn't quite know what they were doing, right? And so again, people didn't know what to do with the plant waste. They kind of weren't quite sure how to, you have to work with kind of modifying the soil. There's a whole bunch of different pieces there. Um, but they were using sunflowers to do with lead. Um, the picture below is uh, brown mustard, which is a really good kind of phytoremediator. Um, and then in the right corner, you have alpine pennycress which is interesting. It's one of the best plants for pulling up lead. People love using sunflowers, but actually lead is really hard to pull up. And there's a bunch of different pieces around pH there, but Alpine Pennycrest does it better than most, right? And so it doesn't really get the fame it deserves. And then you have things like willow and other plants that not so much for pulling up heavy metals, but more for kind of breaking down things like chemicals. So often when we're talking about fire remediation, we're talking about these hyper accumulating plants that kind of like vacuum the heavy metals out. Um, or we're talking about things like trees and grasses that are doing either a piece of pulling it out of the ground or creating the habitat for the beneficial bacteria or the nitrogen fixing bacteria to also break it down. So a lot of grass species are really good, a lot of the grass species and the legumes are good at breaking down hydrocarbons. And people think it's the plant that's doing that, but it's actually the bacteria that they work with that is doing that. So again, nothing is in isolation. So when people start to be like, I'm all about the plants or all about the mushrooms, it's actually, they all work together. And nature uses them kind of in succession or kind of at the same time. And so you kind of have to, in your own design, create that into it. This is a, a famous, this is a permaculture teacher of mine who I love. He's very artistic and likes to make statements. But again, the lead piece when it comes to remediation is a huge question. And a lot of people are dealing with things like lead and arsenic. And so he was actually doing some phytoremediation and making sure everybody knew about it, um, which is interesting. And tomorrow we're going to talk about lead in terms of the protocols and what you would do to deal with lead in your soil. And it's not just phytoremediation. Again, there's several different options, except I would never really recommend mushrooms, even though people always want to do it. But um, this I'm not going to talk about for very long because this is Tom's area of expertise a little bit, and not a little bit, a lot. Um, but this is kind of moving in where plants also get a really good reputation in terms of their healing capabilities is this phytofiltration and their ability to kind of clean up water um, and filter water. And so I think, I don't know, if, I'm, I think you guys have this in Santa Barbara because it's California, but bioswales, mm -hmm. right? Like you have that. I'm from Alberta, we don't. But the West Coast seems to have these beautiful things. But again, bioswales are these amazing things about how do we channel contaminated rainwater, but not just channel contaminated rainwater, but also make our concrete cities more permeable to water so we don't flood and all these different pieces. But again, you can do that. They tend to do it where they're just kind of looking a certain way. You can really put in the right kind of plants to do the remediation piece with that, right? And what they often miss, the picture on the far right is a project in, I think it's Milwaukee, it's Wisconsin, um, where they're not just, they're kind of creating a bit of a, a bioswale kind of um, filtration situation, but they're also using mushrooms. Because that's one thing, you always see people just working with kind of the plants and the bacteria, but there's no reason why when you're looking at some of these bioswells that have wood chips or other things, that there can't be mycelium and they're also doing something. <coughs> and when mycelium, when something is properly myceliated, it actually increases its ability to absorb water, right? So that would actually just accentuate your uh, capabilities there. So, and then the middle picture is all Tom talking about later. That's all floating islands and those beautiful pieces. Again, when we're dealing with any kind of contamination with the water piece, the easiest time you're going to have, I think, is trying to intercept it before it gets into a lake or an ocean, right? When you're trying to get to the runoff or dealing with small creeks, once you're in a bigger body of water, it changes what you're doing. But then we have things like floating islands and, and kind of wetlands and stuff like that that you can work with. But again, all this stuff, bioremediation isn't anything new. Wetlands have been doing this forever, right? Like we're just kind of mimicking that. Now we get into the sexy part. I used to put mushrooms first because everybody wanted to hear about mushrooms first, but then I thought I'd make them wait. <laughs> I think bacteria are more exciting. But microremediation, everybody's heard about that, working with mushrooms to clean up contamination. What's the top left? Boom. And then the bottom? 
You have a micro person. Good, no, you're doing good. And then what's in the corner? The top, I don't know. Stravaria. King Stravaria, and then the bottom? Tremendous person colors. Turkey tail. Turkey tail, awesome. So, that's right. Ones. And again, we always hear about oyster mushrooms in terms of what they can do with oil. I mean, they can do a whole bunch of things, and tomorrow I have a whole list of the different things they do. I didn't put it in this uh, presentation because I was trying to go fast, but they do everything from oil to PCBs. Um, Shaggy Main is actually pretty good for arsenic, right? Button mushrooms, cadmium. So again, if you're buying button mushrooms that were like not farmed organically, I'd be worried, right? Um, and then the Kingster Fair, or otherwise known as Garden Giant, a wine cap, it's really good for a bunch of different things, but one of them is E. coli. It gets often used in kind of gray water situations or dealing with E. coli contamination. And it's also, it helps other plants grow. So people kind of like to kind of, it does well with other, other, um, other organisms, whereas oyster mushroom kind of likes its own thing, right? And then turkey tail is incredible in terms of um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, I think it's mercury, there's a whole bunch of stuff there where it excels. Um, and the best kind of remediation with the mushrooms is if you're able to work with a bunch of them, not just one. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so usually when I talk about fungi, I talk about, it's not just kind of the saprophytic fungi, like the ones you just saw, which are kind of like the, the ones that grow on wood, right? That break down wood, break down twigs and leaves. Um, they are what we usually talk about when we're dealing with things like hydrocarbons because they have adapted to break down something very similar to a hydrocarbon, which is cellulose and lignin, right? And so if you look at that molecule, which is you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and you look at some of the hydrocarbon molecules, they're not that different. And the way these mushrooms work, when they will excrete, they will basically like kind of throw out their digestive juices, break something down, and then eat it. So they digest, then they ingest, whereas humans ingest and then we digest. Right? But it's those kind of enzymes that they send out that are part of breaking down things like an oil molecule to make it into a sugar. And then they kind of bring it in. Which is why people get so excited because it seems like magic, but they've been doing it forever. So saprophytic fungi, again, that's the oyster mushrooms. I'm not going to talk about it today, but tomorrow we're going to talk more about mycorrhizal fungi and the role that they play in remediation, which is huge. Um, but they're just not as much talked about. Now, another thing people get really excited about with fungi is their ability to filter, right? So we talked briefly about phytofiltration, but microfiltration is huge. This picture, fuzzy picture, and I apologize for that, is actually the mycelium. So I don't know if I kind of, you guys, do people know what mycelium is? Yes. Yes? So in a mushroom, when people talk about the mushroom itself, it's almost like if you were a tree, the mushroom is the apple, and then the mycelium is the tree, right? And so in, in, in kind of micro-remediation, we don't care so much about the mushroom unless we're trying to pull out heavy metals and we want to actually collect the mushroom and pull it out, which is not very efficient. We care more about the mycelium, which is the vegetative body of uh, the fungi, because it's the mycelium that is A, kind of again, like sending out the enzymes and breaking down the contaminants and also acting like an incredible filter, right? It creates this really, really fine kind of web and contaminants have to go through it and either get kind of stuck in it physically, but that's also when you get kind of the enzymes happening. And so the two bags there are kind of these bags of mushroom spawn. And all that white kind of matter is actually like the mycelium having taken over the substrate, which is both the food and the house of the mushroom. So again, if you're dealing with these saprophytic mushrooms, they like wood, they like kind of carbon. So they're often growing on things like wood chips or straw bales or coffee. And so that's kind of what's in that bag. Um, but microfiltration is, very exciting and it does incredible things. And these are just some examples of it. Um, it's not that hard to do, but it's hard to do right. That's always the key, right? And so in this picture on the left, we have bunker spawn. People know bunker spawn, bunker bags? It's basically when you take a burlap sack um, and you take, you have like, like what I showed you before, um, the spawn, like the mushroom spawn, right? Full of like mycelium. You take that and you kind of put it in a burlap sack with like properly treated, wood chips, straw, cardboard, everything that's kind of carbon that that mushroom likes to eat, right? And then you take these bags and you kind of seal them up and you have to let them sit for like a month or two. Um, Cause what you need is you need that mushroom, like you put some spawn in this bag and then the spawn is like, oh, I'm hungry. And it starts to take over all the carbon in the bag and create these filters. If you just throw the mycelium into the bag and say, boom, I have a filter and throw it into a creek, it's not going to do anything because the mushroom has to actually kind of establish the filter, right? And so these bunker spawn, they've been kind of myceliated and they've been kind of 
prepared, and then what you can do, and you can do these with like, that could all be oyster mushroom, it could be one layer's oyster mushroom, the one layer back is turkey tail. You can do them kind of like in succession. You can actually make it so that you find your areas of runoff or whatever kind of contamination and have it so that they are in its path, intercepting it and acting like a filter, right? And again, you can do it in different series of being like, you got oyster mushroom up top, handling these, you have, um, turkey tail down below, and some of the mushrooms have different kind of weaves, like they weave tighter or lighter, and so there's a whole kind of science behind it that's fascinating. But that's kind of bunker spawn put that way. Um, you can kind of do the same thing, kind of burlap, and make these like micro booms, which is like if you were dealing with oil on water, um, that's kind of, again, that's a version of a micro boom with oyster mushrooms. And then the picture to the far right is kind of inoculated straw. Um, that's been put in the path of runoff that's going to come from kind of the fire, the fire stuff that happened in Sonoma County. That's a picture from what they did in Sonoma County after the fire, is they inoculated these kind of straw wattles. And again, they didn't have enough time though for those wattles to be properly inoculated. So they basically put in spawn and then threw it out there and kind of like cross our fingers, hope for the best. But if you had the time, you'd want that to be completely myceliated and then put it down. And you'd know it was myceliated because you'd actually see the white kind of on, on the straw, on the burlap. But the whole point is that the water's supposed to pass through there and do some kind of, again, measure of cleaning, and you wanna have several rounds of that because you can't count on all of it happening in the first round. Talking too fast. No, I just have oh. a question. Yes? How do you deal with the amount of runoff you're gonna get from particular waterways? Yeah. Right, because you're gonna dam it up in particular there's excessive flow, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is understanding like what you're dealing with, and then you also have to probably build like spillways and, and other things into it. Um, and, and the interesting thing about this is, so the micromediation piece in principle, everyone's like, this works, and they've done it in small lab kind of examples where people have done more kind of smaller installations have been like, yes, I tested it and it works. But when you start getting bigger scale, there's in some ways a lack of testing. Folks like Stamets have gotten tighter on that and done bigger scale tests. But I know the folks in Sonoma County, they had to get their stuff out so quick, right? Because we always know like floods follow fire. It's kind of the nature of the season that they wanted to make sure that all this toxic ash didn't slam into their rivers and salmon spawning and all that. And so they kind of threw this stuff out, but they didn't necessarily get to do the testing and the monitoring piece the way they wanted to. And so whether it worked or not is, right? And a lot of the micro-mediators that I know right now are actually skilling up scientifically. Before it was this loose movement where people were like just feeling the vibes and going on faith. And now people are really trying to test it, right? To be like, is this actually working? And under what conditions and, and what happens when it's saturated? Do we even know that it's saturated? Like what does that actually look like, right? Um, and to kind of go off that, it was a good kind of segue. I want to talk about this woman, um, her name is Jess Ann Rubin. One thing with micromediation, if I were to ask you guys to name people who do uh, mushroom work, would you name a bunch of men, <laughs> right? Like most of the people we know who do micromediation that we've heard about, we'll talk about Paul Stamets, Peter McCoy, and they're great guys. Say what? Trad Cotter. Cotter, Jay Schindler, awesome dudes. Um, I like <coughs> friends. But there's actually all these incredible women who are doing mushroom work and no one hears about them. And they're putting on summits, they helped start radical color mycology. There's incredible stuff. So I just got the opportunity with Permaculture Magazine to write a whole article on women in bioremediation. And it was fun because I got to reach out to some of these ladies and hear what they were doing. And this woman, her name is Jess, and she is in Vermont. And she is with a group called Myco Evolve. Um, and she was noticing Lake Champlain in Vermont has a lot of issues with eutrophication and algae. And some of that, I mean, there's a lot of different causes, but a big part of that is the farms and the dairy industry. And they're not <coughs> being riparian buffers and all that kind of E. coli and, and fertilizer and all that stuff going right into the water. And so she wanted to do something about it. And so she decided she was going to do work around kind of creating this kind of microfilters and bunker bags to see, like, can we use that to stop the E. coli and filter the E. coli out? And Paul Stamets had done something like that, you know, many years ago. And so kind of armed with that knowledge, she kind of started growing out um, King Strafaria, because that's the good one that people always hear about for E. coli, and so she was gonna do, she's quite scientific, so she decided she was gonna do a bit of an experiment first in a greenhouse, kind of test it, see how much it absorbs, how it handles cold, how it handles all these different things, and then based on that, she was gonna move it out into the field. Um, and she found a lot of cool things. I just put this picture again, that's Lake Champlain. There's dragons in Vermont, who <laughs> knew? Um, I thought it was cute. But yeah, they have this problem, 
And so she's been doing this really cool greenhouse test of like kind of myceliated wood chips with Kingsterferia and then running kind of the effluent through there. And what she found is that yes, it definitely does work. Um, but she found that something about the remediation process was also releasing phosphorus and nitrogen. And if you're already dealing with eutrophication, where you have too much phosphorus and nitrogen going into your water, this becomes a problem. And no one had actually looked at this before. So again, you need those citizen scientists to be putting that together. And it doesn't mean it's a no-go, but her way of thinking was, okay, we know this is happening. So what we have to do is we have to have these kind of bunker bags or these mycoswales of this inoculated um, mycelium. And then kind of towards the bottom, before it kind of gets into the water, we need to use phytofiltration or use some kind of plant species to kind of pull up that phosphorus and pull up that nitrogen, right? Uh, are you used Bokashi? I have not, but I've heard of Bokashi. Yeah. Would you use it in this situation? Any situation similar to this, I use it in composting soil, mm -hmm. it's used for cleaning up ponds. Yes, yeah, we should talk about that. Yeah, and I mean, I don't, she wanted to really work with like a mix of the plants and the mushrooms, but then she also found that King's Deferia was not the best one for this in terms of the kind of filter that it makes. It creates quite a loose filter. And so she was saying, we need to actually work with not just King's Traferia, but successionally also have turkey tail and reishi because they actually create a tighter filter, right? So there's really neat things. Again, this is someone who, she read Paul Stammer's book, she read my book, she read Peter McCoy's book, got really excited and said, I'm gonna do this work, and then decided to actually do it in a way that's really detail-oriented, that's gonna help everybody do their job better. I just wanted to add one thing, yeah. like, uh, the waddles and the other things you were making. Yeah, uh, I wasn't making them, but somebody else did. Uh, and yeah. biochar too, those in certain percentages yeah. will make the mycelium very happy and also act as a further chelating factor yeah. to lock up and hold and make you mobile yeah. in the environment. Some of those things you're looking at. Yeah. It, it'd be actually more of a, an adsorption. Absolutely. So it, it bind, it bind the, the mm -hmm. organic you. things to the surface and then make them available for, for the microbes to chew on them. Yep. Yeah. And actually, this project, I'm going to talk about, how am I doing on time? You get to five. Five minutes. Cool. Um, as I think we're close to the end. Um, this project is, um, who's heard of Ami Sacho? How oh, fun. This is a learning moment. Um, so Ami Sacho is a really great project that's actually in Ecuador. And this is kind of, I'm sure you guys have heard about Texaco, Chevron Texaco, and the mess they left in the Amazon in Ecuador, where they were doing a lot of oil extraction and they left their tar pits behind because they thought they could get away with that, right? Because they're like, this is indigenous communities, no one's gonna look, we can just kind of leave and kind of leave our toxicity behind. And this has been an issue for over 50 years. And there was actually a project that started, this is maybe more than a decade ago, called the Amazon um, Micro Renewal Project. And then it kind of became co-renewal and then Ami Sacho. It's kind of been in waves where this same kind of group of people have been working with this one community um, and, and these kind of folks down there. Are you from, have you done work with Ant? No, but I know Peter McCoy. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. So there is a lot of interesting work that's happened out of it, but really interestingly enough is the woman on the right, her name is Lexi, and oh. she, again, took a mushroom course. She took a Michael course about five years ago that we taught in Santa Cruz, got really excited, decided she was gonna go down to the Amazon and volunteer for the Amazon Micro Renewal Project. And at that time, that project was kind of, they were coming in and they were talking with the community about bioremediation. They'd done a few kind of installations of taking oil contaminated sludge from the sludge pits and kind of moving them and kind of not, you know, putting them in with um, uh, mycelium and seeing if the oyster mushrooms could break it down. They'd done a few different things, but because it was folks in America always coming in and leaving, it was having a hard time getting started. So Leslie went down and was like, I'm gonna hold this down, fell in love, got married in Ecuador, and never left. Um, and then started out in Sacho. And so it was interesting love because- Love is the answer. Love is always the answer. But it was in this situation because it actually allowed for a strong relationship. Community organizing is so integral. And again, if you're coming in and doing this work, but you're kind of airdropping in and airdropping out, it can kind of burn the community. There's a lack of trust and there's a lack of follow through. And having someone there who actually was like, I'm gonna live here and I'm gonna build a lab and actually be someone who can like stay with the community, it meant that things started to move a bit faster. Um, and there's been some really interesting work, but she's done lots of really interesting kind of micro cultivation, trying to train the local folks and, and kind of just Share, and not just like kind of the cross train, there's also that sharing of the indigenous knowledge and kind of what is actually happening in that area, but kind of training people up to be cultivators so they're not dependent on outside people to come in, right? And so she's been training up like lots of really rad like women. She's also been working, that's a picture of one of the sludge pits and then um, Lexi's lab. She's been working with this really amazing group called UDAPT 
And that's like a, it's basically all the local kind of like farmers and organizers, indigenous organizers who've been fighting Chef Francesco for so long. And for the longest time, they were really focused on kind of the legal cases and the justice piece and the fact that their people are dying. This has some of the highest rates of cancer and medical issues in Ecuador. But now there's, they formed an environmental reparations committee and they want to actually start doing kind of fire remediation work. And so they reached out to Lexi and other folks at Core Renewal to say, okay, like you guys have been talking a big game for a while, let's do this. What does that look like? Um, and so one of the cool things that Lexi's been doing, because again, no one size fits all, one of the great things she's been doing with the help of a lot of folks down there has been kind of doing these surveys of the sludge pits to find indigenous mushrooms that are growing in the sludge. Because again, you can save oyster mushrooms and bring an oyster mushroom down, and you can train mushrooms to eat contaminants in cultivation. That's why it's so important to learn how to cultivate. But also, if you see something like this, it may be a mushroom you can use. And it it's, you know, grows in the area, it's not going to run away from oil, it might actually like it, and then you can actually cultivate that mushroom out and use that in your remediation. And so again, if that citizen scientist kind of approach being like, what is already here? And finding out, does it eat oil, does it not? And if it does, better to work with that than to bring in something external, right? Because it's going to have a way easier chance of surviving. Um, so the other thing that they've been doing is, again, like finding these mushrooms <coughs> that are in the sludge pits and then kind of growing them out and trying to see, do they eat oil or trying to train them to eat oil. And again, you see in that kind of, um, that jar over there, that's a jar that's kind of being, I think it's sawdust. It's like mycelium growing on sawdust, in the petri dish, that's kind of where you can kind of get your mycelium, you can train it to kind of go after certain contaminants. And what they'll do is they'll put kind of the contaminant in the petri dish and then see if the mushroom grows towards it or not. And if it does, then they take that strain and they start bulking it out, because that's the one you want to bring onto your site, because it's going to go the fastest and have the highest chance of survival. And then they can train the mushrooms to eat stuff, right? That's right, yeah. like humans. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although I'm a little worried about those biases, but yeah, you, you heard about the green barrel thing with the mushroom seeds? I'm not going to talk about it. We don't have time. Um, but, so this is another picture of, again, what they were doing in the kind of Amazon micro renewal days where they were taking the oil contaminated sludge and then mixing it in with wood chips and mycelium and then seeing if the oyster mushrooms would break it down, right? Um, and that's kind of an ex situ remediation where you're taking the sludge out and putting it in these lines kind of bins. Now, the other thing I love about um, Amy Sacho and Co Renewal is that they don't just do mushrooms. They're doing many things. And one of the things that they're also working with is the bacterial approach of actually taking, they want to do a bioremediation project where they're going to take this oil contaminated sludge and again make those windrows um, of kind of compost and then kind of turn them, get that hot compost going to break down the oil and be spraying this petrophilic um, compost tea on it. And they want to see if that's going to work. Right? And so they're trying all those different things. The biggest thing with them is they lack funding. Because they're in Ecuador, it's hard to get funding. They're trying to get funding in America. But again, not pe people who are scientific don't always know how to speak to philanthropy. Um, and so they are trying to get funding if you have any rich friends. Um, because they are at this moment where the community is finally ready to be like, we want to do this. We want not only to see these projects happen, but we want to actually get trained up. So they have this whole curriculum, they're doing it in Spanish, they're translating everything over, they're just kind of lacking some of the funding to get it done, but they're pretty much like on the edge of being able to do it. So they're an amazing project. Well, how do they stop it from happening again? How do they keep, how do they, that, that's been it. How do they stop the, the, the oil? The oil that's a whole other question. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, they are working with a situation in that community where they have these pits and they got to figure out how to clean them up. Yeah. And will there be more spills? Yes. And so they are looking at different ways, like some of the farmers nearby, can they make different kind of um, catch areas and filtration areas? But, you know, I think it's baby steps. And I think the biggest thing when it comes to oil is there needs to be a lot of community organizing and direct action to make sure that that stuff never happens. Because once it happens, it is incredibly hard to clean up an oil spill. Right? Um, it's almost impossible. So I'm going to finish because I think it's time. And we'll, we'll have time for questions after, but we want to give Tom some time and the panel. Cool. Yeah. So my last slide, because I'm not going to show you what's after this. Um, so finally, just like another reality check because we talked about a bunch of things. Um, when you're doing this work, it's really important to do no harm. So that means, like, again, if you're coming into communities, it's like don't promise the moon if you can't do it. It also means if you're working with plants and mushrooms, you're not bringing things into an environment that are going to throw it out of balance. 
So people talk a lot about invasive species and how they're really good for remediation, like bamboo is great, water hyacinth is amazing, um, Scotch broom is great, but if you take a wild landscape that's damaged and put that in, you're gonna cause more damage than good, right? And so it's like people always have to think about that. Margie said it earlier, I'm a big fan of asking people to skill up and organize. So you can hear this in a workshop, you can even come tomorrow for three hours and hear me do it deeper. But you gotta kind of go deeper into each of the skill sets. Like you have to become a master at one of them. You have to become really good at mushrooms or bacteria or plants or soil science, whatever it is. Because skilling up means that then you can come onto one of these projects and actually be useful, right? Because just being like, yes, my ceiling does this, doesn't mean the project's gonna work. And so the best kind of groups of people are people who have complementary differences, who like kind of form an amazing guild and have the skills. And if they don't have it, they find the people who do and they call them in, right? Um, and that diversity is really important. And organizing in everything, organizing to fight the projects before they become a problem, and then organizing communities to actually engage with the solutions, right? Um, as I mentioned, funding is an issue. Scaling up, with a lot of these things I'm talking about, they're starting small. They're doing pilot projects. They're trying to figure out kind of what to do, and then they're going to scale up. Because, again, I got into this work because I wanted to see the tar sands remediated, and we're not there yet. But we have to get there, right? And we only get there by people trying. Um, this quick thing about need to preposition resources, if you are doing anything like trying to respond to an oil spill or to a fire, again, what I mentioned with the mushrooms, if you do not have these bunker bags or these bottles that are actually myceliated, you've lost time, right? Because you need to be able to throw that on it immediately. So if you have people who are doing this work, who are kind of keeping this stuff, you know, just on hand, it means you can respond quicker, right? So that idea, of, and again, Sonoma County was able to respond fairly quickly because they have a lot of mushroom people and they have a lot of compost people. And that's why they actually responded where other communities haven't been able to do that. But who you have in your community is important and kind of having these things on hand is important. Safety, I didn't really get to talk about this because I think that's the next slide. Um, you're dealing with toxic things. And when you're dealing with toxic things, you've got to take care of yourself. So if there's an oil spill and you're like, I'm going to go throw my semen on it, which hopefully you won't because I've told you not to. If you decide to do that, you better be wearing a respirator and gloves and tie bed because you want to be breathing this thing in. If you're working with lead contaminated soil, you're going to want to wear certain things to protect yourself because you're important. And if you want to be doing this work for a long time, you have to take care of yourself. Um, we're not talking about that, so I'm just going to fast forward. That's tomorrow. Um, Detox and self-care, like I mentioned, you could be sexy like those guys, right? <laughs> like that is a good look. It's a really good look. But that's only for oil. That's only for oil. It's not the same if you're working with different things. Um, but just before I go, I just want to say that a lot of the plant allies and the mushroom allies that we work with not only heal the land, but they heal our own bodies, right? Like they do incredible things. The mushrooms, turkey tail is incredible when it comes to things like breast cancer. Um, Reishi is an incredible mushroom when it comes to helping your liver. And a lot of times when people are exposed to toxins, their liver takes a hit. It also is incredible when it comes to dealing with multiple chemical sensitivity. So if people have been around toxins so much, they can actually get this thing where they kind of over respond to everything. And they found that reishi can kind of take that down a notch. Cilantro, really good for helping get rid of heavy metals in your body. Milk thistle supports your liver. Dandelion is another liver thing. And in the corner, you have lion's mane which is an incredible mushroom, not just for things like memory and Alzheimer's, but also for the central nervous system. A lot of folks found that the BP spill, because of the dispersants and the oil, they were kind of, that stuff can kind of eat away at your central nervous system. And again, that's a terrible kind of, if you've ever watched someone have to go through that, um, it's a really debilitating situation. And things like lion's mane could be helpful, right? And so again, it's like they're not, these beings are not just helping us on the land, they're helping us with ourselves. Um, and that's it, I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to keep on. That's my email. If you ever want to email me, if you have a question, um, and buy my book so I can buy myself clothes. <laughs> and then we're going to do questions at the end. So, get rid of this. Thanks. You're welcome. Wow, well, what a. Uh... What a tour de force. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this was uh, really appreciate the uh, the skill that you brought forth in your presentation. The the uh, need to learn and the difference between the rhetoric and the doing. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. So thank you. Well, we now switch to Tom, who will go into the global water issues, and I'm particularly struck by your work in China, 
I've spent some time in China and uh, over a 30-year period saw the massive pollution uh, in that country. I mean, indescribable pollution. Air quality for, uh, horrible air quality for two generations now in that country. So, uh, I know we're getting tight on time, so Tom, please come up and begin. <laughs> on that same level there, but I'll try and be as informative and insightful as I can. Uh, so, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Yeah. yeah. So for the last, uh, well, 19 years now, I've been involved in uh, phytoremediation, bioremediation of waters. And I guess I grew up on uh, family farms here, there, and everywhere, sort of amongst our like, collective the family group. We had a lot. Of, we had farms in coastal areas. I grew up a lot in the water, swimming, surfing, eating out of the ocean, and felt very connected to the water um, and the waters that flow in there. And when we we had some pretty bad toxic algal blooms uh, come through and kill all the oyster uh, production uh, in the our area, and we also had a farm on a river uh, which is as long as the Amazon, uh, and it was regularly uh, dying. Toxic algal blooms and all the fish would float to the surface. So, it sort of early on, got a sense for you know something wasn't quite right. And being from Australia, you know, we're a constant of very extreme uh, weather and circumstances. Yeah, we, we tend to have very long droughts, uh, and then we'll have years of floods, uh, and it could cover the entire nation. So it's a it's definitely canary in the coal mine, so to speak, of both climate change. Okay, so, so yeah, I invented this technology called the Aqua Biofilter. I was an intern with the Zero Emission Research and in Initiatives in uh, Germany in the year 2000. And uh, Gunter Pauli was the founder of that uh, organization. He, he wrote a book called, called Blue Economy. And it really inspired me to you know, start something. And one of our lecturers uh, who was teaching us there during the six month program was uh, Professor George Chan. And he, he'd been working with, <clears throat> yeah, there's a little bit of feedback there. I want to just step back there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, George Chan had been working on aquaculture and growing uh, rice on top of fish ponds. And the reason for that was, let's get this a little bit forward. Yeah, correct. Turn it a little bit. Awesome. And face this a little bit this way. Yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Speak right into it. Okay. Wow. And loud. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. So is this is this the right zone? I'm in the zone? Yes. Great. Uh, so George Chan was experimenting uh, with growing rice on fish ponds to take up excess nutrients. Uh, that in in, in uh, China and Southeast Asia you have really intensive aquaculture uh, based on dumping animal manure straight into ponds to seed uh, the blooms, right, which then you get very uh, very productive aquaculture, but it has a whole lot of knock-on effects. If you have uh, adverse environmental conditions, you can get very bad fish kills uh, and pretty anoxic conditions. So they were looking for solutions. So they were starting to grow uh, rice onto the fish ponds using bamboo trellises and floating systems. And that really inspired me to say, well, how can we turn this technology into a large-scale sort of bioremediation technology? Um, the funny thing is, the first uh, the first uh, program I saw at university was banking and finance, <laughs> because we lost our, our farm to one of our farms to the, the banks in the 1990s. So I was like, damn, I'm gonna get these bastards back. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I studied that, and so I'm doing something at the moment in a fintech company uh, called Liquid Token, which is basically a, a fundraising platform, but where we digitize the equity so that it's tradable. Uh, and so it's just 
yeah, we use blockchain technology to do that. So this is, I sort of have two tracks in my life. One is financial technology, another is environmental technology. Uh, the environmental technology was back in 2000, this is more recent. Uh, I studied computer science as well, and environmental science, I'm a perennial student. Because Gunter Pauli was like, you know what, don't become a specialist. Specialists suck, that's why we're in the situation we're in. You know, become a generalist of many things. Uh, so this is kind of the global sort of picture. You know, there was never enough money to do in bioremediation and clean up the planet. So my perspective was, well, how do you create a new financial architecture to kind of overcome that? So there's global assets about $350 trillion. And global stock markets actually, it was up at 80 trillion. Since the recent fall, it's closer now to 70, I think. Um, if you want to look at what's the money to reverse global warming, 300 ppm just doing reforestation, regenerative uh, farming and holistic management, that's about 4.3 trillion. So the idea is how do you actually increase funds into regeneration and cleaning up the planet, healing it. Uh, and so we've developed a financial technology that's kind of aiming at that, um, which we would love to get into some of the other environmental cleanup projects we've been involved with. I won't go into too much depth. I'm going to get back to my environmental track. <laughs> This is what you've come here to see. Uh, so, so floating wetlands, what are they? Um, and how do we clean up polluted lakes and rivers before the water gets to the ocean? Um, I think people are familiar with a recent report that said uh, the last mass extinction of 96% of all life was when the ocean was six degrees warmer, right? Uh, and the ocean's already warming very significantly. And so if the problem is, if the ocean sort of flips and goes anaerobic in enough zones, you know, then that really speeds up that timeline for the ocean warming. So that's kind of the relevance of, you know, what's the relevance of cleaning up waterways and lakes before all the nutrient and toxicants gets to the ocean to create the ocean dead zones. And like what Lila was saying, we need to get upstream of these things to be intervening before it ever gets to the oceans. Uh, so at source treatment, uh, which means widely distributed systems, uh, which permaculture and that sort of fractal design methodology, you know, at any scale, you can do these systems, but it's bioswales and rain gardens through the large flooding wetlands. Now, the problem with conventional constructed wetlands and natural wetlands is that most conventional wetlands, after about five years, become net generators of nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, so if you just let that sink in, think about how many Actually, billions and billions of dollars have gone into constructed wetlands around the world. And about two thirds of them are most definitely producing net nitrogen and phosphorus. And the reason is uh, that the, the water level rises and falls in wetlands. And where these wetlands are being built, whether it's urban zones, you, know, you don't quite know exactly how much catchment you've got, what the intensity of the rainfall is how many pipes are connected to that catchment and then how much water is going to flow into the constructed wetland. You don't have an exact uh, hard surface area, an exact flow. You just don't know. It's fuzzy science because nearly all the stormwater infrastructure is not precisely mapped. So I worked in Melbourne Water, uh, which basic Melbourne Water is the, the water catchment manager that, and also responsible for the rivers uh, and all the waste treatment plants serving about 5 million people about 1.3 million hectares of land, uh, tens of thousands of miles of waterways to manage. And so we did a, a really big study called Better Waterways, uh, Better Bays and Waterways. And it was a five year plan for spending about a billion dollars on wetlands, floating wetlands, and bioswales in the urban environment. And we doled out about $100 million to urban and rural uh, ecosystem services provider under a tender system. Now, till that point, Melbourne Water had just been building conventional wetlands. And their maintenance bill was becoming such a massive cost of excavating these wetlands every five years because they were just completely filling up with too much sediment. They were undersized uh, and they weren't actually performing what they were meant to be performing, which was cleaning up the water before it got to the ocean. So don't allocate investment into things that don't work. That's the message. Um, these things do work, and the reason is because they rise and fall with the, the water. Um, what happens with wetlands is this water flow that's going past the, the macrophytes and the uh, sedges and grasses, there's a biofilm that's attached to the leaf 
to the surface area. And that biofilm is very complex algal and bacterial biofilm. It's very, very complex and very little is understood about those complex colonies. But what we do know is that those biofilms are the things that actually provide the treatment mechanism. So as the water flows past the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, heavy metals, uh, whether it's lead, um, zinc, what have you, it's the biofilms, these sticky biofilms, which is attracting the nutrient. Okay, and what happens, those biofilms then fall off the leaves and fall down onto the ground uh, into the sludge and then under anaerobic conditions usually uh, down in that sludge you get denitrification to the atmosphere and that's often how wetlands are working mostly. You get some uptake in the leaves, but the problem is those, those leaves are growing and as soon as the water fills up in a large rainfall event, they're all dying. And all that nutrients being released back into the water, back into your oceans, which was not what you wanted to achieve. So, so in that context, conventional wetlands just don't work, uh, the vast majority of them. And really long-term studies have been done on this. Uh, most consulting engineers will tell you the opposite until they're blue in the face because they've been building them for 30 years. The idea that they don't work and they don't do the job they're meant to do is, is it's like a, that's like killing the sacred cow of environmental engineering. So, so why floating wetlands? They, they move up and down and they don't die in, in large rainfall events, which we're definitely absolutely getting in under climate change. Now, the other cool thing is you get heaps more root zone and therefore surface area. So you've got massive increase in surface area because you've now got biofilms attaching to root zones. You can see an exploded view there. The algal and bacterial biofilms are forming around those roots. And you've just got massive surface area compared to leaves. So if you, if you wanted to think, well, the leaves is giving you that surface area, whereas the roots, it's just so much more. And these plant roots, they can actually grow down seven, eight meters, depending how deep your pond is. So we've done uh, experiments with vetiver. Vetiver grows down like eight meters deep. So it just, it's incomparable. The surface area you're getting here, you can 10x, 100x, 1,000x of conventional wetland. The other cool thing is, in, in this system, it's very difficult to catch colloidally suspended heavy metals, which is what uh, was mentioned earlier, like all the really nasty things that you want to stop at the source. It's actually really hard to capture um, with a conventional wetland. It just doesn't work. It flows through um, because they're colloidally suspended and it's, a lot of these systems are not sized to the catchments that are flowing into them. So here the idea is the roots you've actually got enough surface area to catch colloidally suspended heavy metals, which are the toughest ones to treat. Uh, the other thing is, see this on the right, potential phytoplankton growth? That's where toxic algal blooms grow. So the idea is, okay, you've got a niche which algae thrives, and that niche is uh, open water, which has lots of nutrients in it, and it's sunny enough and warm enough for it to then bloom. So the idea is, well, you know, in permaculture, if it's, if it's, you know, there's no such thing as waste, it, it's something that's out of place and you need to put something there uh, which will uh, utilize that. So the thing that will utilize it is floating islands. And in peak wetland ecosystems, floating islands will naturally occur. You get debris forming and over years and years and years, birds make nests, fishes, uh, shrimp, other things will make uh, their habitat in there, eels, fish spawning ground you get these very mature ecosystems with floating islands and many cultures around the world even constructed their own floating islands like in Lake Titicaca, uh, in the Arab marsh lands of Iraq, which is now completely poisoned with um, chemical weapons. Um, you know, they were really extensive, amazing floating systems that had perfected such productivity uh, and usually it was also a, sort of a, a tool against a, a, aggression that you can get away from your people as well attack and take stuff. So, yeah, so white floating wetlands, I've covered that a bit. Toxic algal blooms in eutrophic water bodies create significant public health risks. So I don't know if you've noticed, but Department of Health in the US, they did a study on, um, in the CDC, on the outbreak of um, ALS, or motor neuron disease, um, across the US. And what they found were that the outbreaks uh, were, you had these clusters, the outbreaks of motor neuron disease. What's going on here? This is really strange. So then they overlay maps and lakes, uh, another environmental data. Is there anything environmental that could be causing this? 
Absolutely there was. And what it was is toxic algal blooms. So around Lake Tahoe, you have these little clusters. Uh, in other lake areas, you have these clusters of motor neuron disease. And what it is, when the toxic algal blooms happen, it produces an airborne element, and then that is just floating around everywhere. And if you're living in that area, you're just breathing it in, the chances of getting that disease are at least 10x. So it's really, it's a public health threat, and no one's really talking about it. Um, but the communities who are being affected by it, you know, they're going to be affected by it. So I'm expecting class action lawsuits, all sorts of things to happen as a result of that um, mismanagement of catchments um, and misallocation of capital. So, so floating wetlands increase ecosystem effectiveness. So for example, the root zone of a floating wetland of just 23 square meters is equal to about one acre of conventional constructed wetland. So it's just mind-boggling how much more effective surface area you have to treat nutrients and pollutants at the soil. So dairy, uh, ponds, uh, industrial ponds, whatever ponds you want to talk about, uh, it's just a better use of land space. Cost-effective way to install lakes. Uh, and I'll go into some uh, case studies. Uh, the cool thing is there's no die-off of the plants releasing nutrients. You know, the plants are on top of the raft and it's senescing. Uh, naturally, and so you've got nutrient going up into the air as a gas, uh, particularly nitrogen, which is what's really fueling algal blooms. Uh, also phosphorus, but um, nitrogen is what's the, the big one. Water hyacinths, weeds is a really big problem in many parts of the world, and huge spraying of things like Roundup and other really toxic herbicides are going into water directly because water hyacinth is there, and that's an absolute disaster. So the idea is how do you take up a niche of a water hyacinth, just do what nature does uh, in peak ecosystems, and that's floating islands that naturally occur. Um, there's hardly any peak wetland ecosystems left in the world though, so it's hard to find them. Okay, so there's, there's the doom and gloom. Here's the, <laughs> here's the upside. Um, so this is uh, zinc and, and copper uptake in floating wetlands. Uh, this study was done by NIWA, the uh, National Institute for Water and Atmosphere in New, New Zealand. Uh, they did this study on floating wetlands and how it photostabilizes metals because uh, they've got pretty big problems. Um, they've got natural metals that, from all the volcanic eruptions. Uh, they've just got very high amount of metals in soil, similar to Peru actually. So if you eat organic Peru, cacao, like you're probably getting high levels of certain metals because they're just naturally there from volcanic kind of activity. So that's then flowing into your water, it's then flowing into kind of your oysters, your fisheries and everything else and impacting things. So they did a lot of studies on this and then it gives you a breakdown of actual species that took up the most. Uh, you know, you've got Juncus, Cyprus, um, Bobochinus, for the Artelis, some really cool names in there. Um, but really it tells you, you know, what's the most effective for what particular metal. And it's very precise information. In the US, you have equivalent species. Um, in Canada as well, that are suitable for cold climates. What they've found is even uh, if you've got ice covering a lake, the root systems are still working away because you've still got microbial uh, colonies working in, in freezing conditions. So it's pretty cool. So yeah, I was in uh, China in, in 2004. And in 2004, uh, there was an AusAid and China a joint partner uh, project of five years. It was a water and agriculture management uh, project that surrounded, it was about 18.7 million hectares, uh, including the Inner Mongolia grasslands, where we're doing holistic management plan grazing, uh, and then doing a lot of permaculture um, kind of design at a mass scale, rolling out in lots of villages. On the side, I was doing this project of my own, which was um, floating wetlands further down south uh, in Lake Tai. So this is Lake Tai, also known as Taihu. Uh, it's the third largest lake in China. It's got drinking water for hundreds of millions of people because it's near Shanghai and uh, Wuxi and um, yeah, it, it feeds so many different areas in that hugely populated area. And this was a this was a three-acre-plus project where we installed floating wetlands. 
um, this, this broader team. It was actually a lot of Chinese research scientists involved in the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, and we used uh, canna lily, we used cypress, Egyptian sedge, uh, because they had to look pretty, otherwise they weren't going to allow it to happen. So we're like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Um, but, you know, these things were super effective, so we, you know, you, you filter down, okay, which studies look nice, uh, which species look, look nice, and then you study, okay, which ones can actually absorb all the nutrients and else, so, yeah. Um, so that was the water beforehand on the left, and that was the, the water after on the right, and that beaker has just transformed. Uh, and people started coming back and having picnics and sorts of things. Um, yeah, so it was really transformative, and subsequently, uh, yeah, massive uh, tens of millions of dollars got uh, got um, implemented there to actually build permanent uh, constructed wetland zones, which was not quite what we did with flooding wetlands, but it was you know an improvement um, because again, most environmental engineering consulting firms just they love designing constructed wetlands. That's their bread and butter. So unfortunately, um, they didn't go with floating wetlands in the end. Um, so here you can see that what the root zones were looking like after three months. It's pretty big. Um, yeah, this is another project in 2007 in Nanjing, which was floating wetlands and biodigester power, um, which was quite interesting. So it was so this this one here in the foreground. Um, it's kind of, it's actually written in Chinese characters saying respect water um, as a social message. And all these skyscrapers that were being built, you can see a lot of um, yeah, construction on the sides. So we big baffles to capture all the large gross pollutants and then these systems to soak up all the nutrients and metals. There was also a lot of um, you know, nasty things in the water, uh, drugs and also, yeah? What would be the maintenance of these things? Ron? We're, we're sorry, but we're super short on time, so yeah. we can hold your questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah, happy to answer after. So, yeah, this was a Sorry, uh, okay. water supply affected by lead, uh, and so the wave action is just constantly resuspending the heavy metals, so we can capture them with flowing wetlands. Um, this is a project in Australia. Um, yeah, that's it after three years' growth, but net removed. Uh, and there's actually trees now growing out of it, so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so the, you know, uh, they started seeing uh, platypus and uh, turtles come back, and this was right in the centre of uh, a very big regional town, which was right on the river, which has just recently died, um, and just completely emptied of water, uh, and, and uh, millions of fish died. So it's, you know, from a, a big cotton farm illegally taking water upstream several thousand kilometres away. So. But this area survived that um, because it's got its it's 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 a slightly offline system. So another one we did. Um, this one had a problem with the zola. So the zola, the zola is often talked about in permaculture, but and it's got its uses if you're using it in a controlled area. But if it gets out into the wild, mm -hmm. this this lake was completely covered in the zola. So this is what it looked like beforehand. Um, you just basically from here to here and all around that's all azola. So that's and what happens when it dies, um, all that nutrient then floats to the it uh, goes down to this uh, the sediment. And then every time it rains, it gets resuspended and then it's sunny and then you get a toxic algal bloom and it dies and it just repeats and repeats. So again you need to find something that's gonna take up the niche of an aquatic weed so you don't have to spray it with herbicide and poison the ecosystem. So yeah, so this was a this was Sydney Harbour, uh, which was a floating habitat island for endangered bird species, uh, which was the first of its kind in the world. But, and we used salt marsh, uh, which was an endangered species as well in Sydney, uh, which they eat and they make their nests out of, and it went really well. Um, Malaysia River of Life, that, that was a one billion dollar program to clean up their river that goes through Kuala Lumpur. Uh, tradition, the name Kuala Lumpur, I think it means um, muddy confluence is the original um, name for <laughs> that area. So it is the muddy confluence of many rivers. This is an old tin mine, and this is the vetiver. This is the floating vetiver wetlands, which um, grew down eight meters, uh, taking up lots of uh, metals. 
and also cleaning up the nutrients before they're released. Um, yeah, so I, don't, I think we can finish there. And um, yeah, uh, because we need to get power. So thank you very much for listening.